Well, hello class, welcome to book four. Um, now we're getting into some really interesting uh, conversation between the gods. So we're going to change the scene to the gods. Okay, so we just had the Achaeans and now we're going to change the scene to the god. And um, up on Mount Olympus, okay, uh, we have the gods. Now the gods at the side of Zeus were sitting in council over the golden floor. And among them, the goddess Hebe poured them nectar as wine, while they and the golden drinking cups drank to each other, gazing down on the city of the Trojans. Uh, note here, Hebe is the goddess of youth, or the prime of life, okay? So that's Hebe. She is the goddess of youth, and um, she is one of Zeus's daughters. She's just pouring the, um, the nectar and the wine. All right. Presently, the son of Kronos. That's an epithet for Zeus, right? So we could just tie that in if you want. Uh, presently, the son of Kronos was minded to anger Hera, to make Hera angry, if he could, with words offensive. Now, sometimes this happens in these texts. They just switch the word around. You could say with offensive words, right? Words that are hurtful speaking to cross her or make Hera angry, okay? Now, here's a question you could ask. Is Zeus being petty? Or is Zeus being petty? Or is there a bigger plan here? Is Zeus being petty or is there a bigger plan? I think if we pay attention, we're going to see that there is a bigger plan here with Zeus. I'm going to move this back. Okay, good. So he says, two among the goddesses stand beside by Menelaus. Okay, so we just had the, the duel between Menelaus and Paris. Okay, Hera and Athena. Now we already know this. Hera and Athena support the Achaeans, so it makes sense that they stand by Menelaus, who stands by her people. Yet see, here they are sitting apart, looking on the fighting with, and take their pleasure. Meanwhile, laughing, laughing Aphrodite. Now, if we're going to make Hera angry, then adding these little words like laughing is a great way to do that. Remember why I drew the dagger in the previous texts, right? They're kind of sticking a little further. This is basically doing that. He's... Zeus is kind of sticking, he's poking at Hera a little by saying, laughing Aphrodite, forever stands by her man and drives the spirits of death away from him. Even now, she has rescued him when he thought he would perish. So the victory now is with warlike Menelaus. So listen, we have a victor. Guys, that means we can go home, right? And Zeus says that right now. Listen, let's consider how to get how these things shall be accomplished. Whether again to stir up again grim warfare and terrible fighting, or cast down love and make them friends with each other. So do we want war or peace? We have the opportunity for peace now. If somehow this way could be sweet and pleasing to all of us, the city of the Lord Priam might still be a place men dwell in, and Menelaus would take away with him Helen of Argos. Now I mentioned up here that there might be a bigger plan. And down here, Zeus is kind of playing, um, he's using reverse psychology a lot better than Agamemnon does because obviously wants um, the fighting to continue. He needs the fighting continue so that he can honor Achilles. All right, continuing on. So he spoke, and Athena and Hera muttered, since they were sitting close to each other, devising evil for the Trojans. Still, Athena stayed silent and said nothing, but only sulked at Zeus her father, and savage anger took hold of her. <laughs> She's just sitting there sulking uh, like a teenager. But the heart of Hera could not contain her anger, and she spoke forth. Majesty, son of Kronos, right? There's once again that epithet for Zeus. 
What sort of thing have you spoken? How can you wish to make wasted and fruitless all this endeavor? All that means is everything we've we've worked on, right? All our endeavors, all the things we've worked on. How? Why would you want to waste that and make it fruitless? The sweat that I have sweated in toil. And my horse is worn out, gathering my people and bringing evil to Priam and his children. She truly, truly wants to bring evil to Priam and his children. Right? Do it then, but not all the rest of us gods will approve you. Deeply troubled Zeus, who gathers the clouds, answered her, Dear lady, what can be all the great evils done to you by Priam and the sons of Priam, that you are thus furious forever to bring down the strong-founded city of Ilion? Now, we know one of the main ones is that Paris snubbed her um, in the decision that he made um, between her, um, Athena, and Aphrodite. So that's one of the major reasons that this is happening. Now, this is this always... All students in all my classes always look at this and they're like, what in the world? If you could walk through the gates and through the towering ramparts and eat Priam and the children of Priam raw. Raw. Oh, that's gross. And the other Trojans, only then might your anger be glutted. Only then might you glut at last your anger. This means satisfy your anger. So only if you could walk, you're so angry at Priam and the Trojans that only if you could eat them raw. Death isn't good enough for them. You have to eat them raw. That would be the only way to satisfy your anger. Ugh. Gross. Do as you please then. Never let this quarrel hereafter be between you and me and bitterness for both of us so zeus plans plans works right zeus plans works he wants the fighting to continue and now hera is gonna do it for him and put away your thoughts and your thoughts this other thing i tell you that whenever i in turn am eager eager to lay waste some city as i please one in which you are dwelling men who are dear to you you should not stand in the way of my anger but let me do it since i was willing to grant you this with my heart and willing note that zeus plan not only works his reverse psychology not only works but he also gets a future benefit from it so by him making him by him making it seem like this is hera's idea to destroy troy okay all right or to get the fighting going again he gets a future benefit for it since I was willing to grant you this with my own willing, for the future cities beneath the sun and the starry heaven dwelt in it beneath by men and who left, who live on, upon earth, there will, has never been one honored nearer to my heart than sacred Ilion and Priam. So whether or not this is true or not, I think it is true. Um, but it could just him be playing games with Hera again. But he's saying there's never been one dearer no city dearer to his heart than Ilion and priam so troy is near is dear to his heart and the people of priam right Ilion is troy of the strong i spear never yet has my altar gone without their sacrifice and the libation and the savor and this is our portion of honor so he's saying that Troy, okay, offers many sacrifices, and so he loves the city. Okay, moving on. Then the goddess, the oxide, Hera, answered, Of all the cities, there are three that are dearest to my own heart, Argos and Sparta and Mycenae of the my wide ways. All these, whenever they become hateful to your heart, sack or destroy utterly. So it's a deal, right? It's a deal. I will not stand up for the, these against you, nor yet begrudge you. Yet if even so I bear malice and would not have 
you destroy them. In malice, I would accomplish nothing since you are stronger. So she's saying, listen, let's just not have hate here. You're stronger. Let's just make a deal. Yet my labor will should also not should yet my labor also should not be let go un, unaccomplished. How's that for a weirdly worded sentence? I am likewise a god. I am also god, and my race is even what yours is. And I am first the daughters of the devious devising Cronus. She's also the daughter of Cronus. Remember both ways, since I am eldest born, and I am called your consort or your companion or wife yours and you are in turn the lord over all mortals all right so basically in some ways we are equal okay so let's make this deal together come then in this thing let us both give way to each other let's compromise i to you you to me so that the rest of the immortal gods will follow now in speed give orders to athena all right we're giving orders to athena what is athena supposed to do well, Athena is going to visit horrible war again on the Achaeans of Trojans. All right, so war is what we're doing. And try to make it so that the Trojans are the first offenders to do injury against the oaths to the far-famed Achaeans. So Hera doesn't just want war to start, obviously. She hates the Trojans. She wants the Trojans to be at fault. And she's going to make sure that happens. All right, continuing on. And so she spoke. That's, of course, Hera. Hera spoke. Nor did the father of the gods, that's Zeus. And men disobey her. But immediately he spoke in wing words to Athena. And said, he's speaking. By the way, I notice I haven't been doing the brackets for speaking. I apologize. Go now swiftly to the host of the Achaeans and the Trojans and try to make it so the Trojans are the first offenders, right? Same thing, exact same words up here. Remember we talk about um, memorizing things? So exactly the same. And do injury against the oaths to the far-famed Achaeans. Speaking, so he stirred up Athena, who was eager before this, and she went in a flash of speed down the pinnacles of Olympus. Now, anytime we start with a lot, um, an as or just as or like, um, we have these things called epic similes. And you've had some before, um, but I like to point them out when I see them because I think they're wonderful um, and they're really interesting to talk about and share in class. So um, if you see epic similes, point them out because they're really cool. As when the son of Decius, Devious Devising Cronus cast down a star a portent, a sign to sailors or to widespread armies of peoples glittering and thickly the sparks of fire break from it. So this is basically a shooting star, right? Okay. In such likeness, Pallas Athena swept flashing earthwards and plunged between the two hosts and amazement seized the beholders. So note here that this epic simile is comparing Athena coming down from Olympus to a shooting star that hits the ground and sparks of fire fly from it. Okay, so um, note here that a lot of these, when we look at these epic similes, a lot of them have to do with natural, natural phenomenon. Okay, things that you would see in nature. And this is completely normal because you see something epic in nature. And if you believe in gods, then you, a natural assumption would be that the gods did this natural phenomenon in nature. All right. And so that happens. And amazement seized the beholder, the people who sought the Trojans, the breakers of horses and the strong grieved Achaeans. And thus they would speak to each other, each looking at the man next to him. So this is all the mortals talking here. Surely again there will be evil and war terrible on fighting, or else now friendship is being cast between both sides by Zeus, who is appointed lord in the wars of mortals. So what good intuition? They're like, listen, we're either going to have peace or we're going to war, and the gods are discussing it. Okay, And this happens a lot as well in these books, that the mortals kind of know what's going on, even though it's not readily explained how they would know. But that's just the format that we're reading here. That's just the way Homer writes. All right, moving on. 
Thus would murmur any man, a Cain or Trojan. She, Athena, in the likeness of a man, merged among the Trojans assembled. So she came down and came among the Trojans. Who? What does she look like? Remember, one of the uh, things that the gods can do is uh, disguise themselves. Laodokos, Antenor's sons, a powerful spearman. So she appears as this man, searching for godlike Pandaros. So obviously, this man here, Laodokos, is somebody that Pandaros would trust. If she might somewhere come on, come on him. And she found the son of Lycoan, so that's Pandaros. A man blameless and powerful, standing still, and about him were the ranks of the strong, shield-armored people who had followed him from the streams, Aespos, those people are around him, and speaking in winged words, she stood beside him and spoke to him. So Athena is going to talk. Why, son of Lycoan? Now, you're going, I would say here, why she's going to come down and try and trick him, right? So... She's calling him wise, but is he really wise or foolish? Would you now let me persuade you? So you might dare send a flying arrow against Menelaus, and win you glory and gratitude in the sight of all Trojans, and particularly beyond all else with Prince Alexandros. So that's Paris. So think about this way. Listen, if you send an arrow against Menelaus, you will win glory, and Paris will especially love you, right? Because you're going to take out the guy who just defeated him. Beyond all beside you, you would carry away glorious gifts from him, from Paris. Were he, were he to see warlike Menelaus, the son of Atreus, struck down by your arrow and laid on the sorrowful corpse fire. Come then, let go an arrow against haughty Menelaus, but make your prayer to Apollo the Lightborn, the glorious archer. Now this is actually, it almost sounds like good advice, right? Hey, pray to Apollo, this would be a wise thing to do. So that you will accomplish a grand sacrifice of lambs and firstborn went home again to the city of sacred Zelia. Okay, so she tries to convince Pandarus to shoot Menelaus for glory. All right, continuing on here. So spoke Athena and persuaded the fool's heart in him. So I guess Pandarus is a fool. We talked about that, right? Straight away, Ray, he unwrapped his bow of the polished horn from a running wild goat he himself had shot in the chest once, lying in wait for the goat in a covert as it stepped down from the rock and hit it in the chest so it sprawled on the boulders. The horns that grew from the goat's head were sixteen palms length. A boyer working on the horn then bound them together, smoothing them to a fair surface and put on a golden string hook. Now, this is what I like to call an origin story. It's not the official name for it, probably, but it's, it's an origin story. And there's a few purposes here. First of all, it shows Pandarus' skill. And then it sh also shows us the size and size of the bow. Which we're going to read here in a second here is quite large. Pandaros strung his bow and put it in position, bracing it against the ground. So here's one of Mr. Troop's fantastic um, drawings for you again. You can see here, this is a very large bow. It's not like the bows that we have today. It's gonna to be large, bracing it against the ground, okay? And his brave friends held their shields in front of him for fear the warlike sons of the Achaeans might rise up and rush him before he had struck warlike Menelaus, the son of Atreus. Okay, and he stripped away the lid of the quiver and took out an arrow, feathered, and never shot before, the transmitter of dark pain. A couple of things to note here. I underlined a couple sections. First of all, the transmitter of dark pain is just dark as blood. Okay, so this is when the arrow hits you, you bleed. So it transmits, it carries dark pain. An interesting question you could put here is why mention that it's never been shot before? Okay, and there's many reasons for this. Um, one could be that there has, throughout time, always been a purity and a value associated with things that have never been used before. Um, we have it today, think in sneakers, right? Or something that's 
pristine, right, and unblemished, okay? And so the idea that the arrow has never been shot before, um, it just kind of falls, I think, that this is, this is an arrow, this is a clean, uh, pure arrow, okay? And, and there's value to that arrow that's never been shot before. Swiftly he arranged the bitter arrow along the bowstring and made his prayer to Apollo the lightborn. So I should have circled that. Okay, there's Apollo and an epithet for Apollo right there. The glorious archer, that he would accomplish a grand sacrifice of lambs firstborn when he came home again to the city of sacred Zelia. Remember, he had promised that exactly the same words up here with Athena, right? Up here and down here. And once again, I've mentioned this many times to you, it's exactly the same words because we're memorizing it. And we, when we're memorizing, that's, that's useful to have the exact same words. Moving down. Okay. Um, he drew, holding at once the grooves of the oxide bowstring and brought the string against his nipple, iron to the bowstave. Now today, we, if you do archery, if you've done it, you know you bring the string to your cheek. But I told you this is a large bow. Uh, me, if you are a student of history, maybe you know about the English longbows that were incredibly large as well, but they were also incredibly powerful and they helped people win a lot of wars. So this is a large bow. Before you get all the tricks and stuff that we use on modern bows, the best way to get a, a powerful bow was to make it large and long, all right? But when he had pulled the great weapon till it made a circle, so these two Ds here, this is just a bow before, and then if you pull really hard, right, the, the uh, front side of the bow would make a circle. So this means he pulled it really hard. The bow groaned and the string sang high and the arrow, sharp pointed, leapt away furious to fly through the throng before it. As an English teacher, I just have to stop here and say, isn't this beautifully written? When I ask you for detail when you describe something, this is what I'm talking about. You can add detail and make it so much more interesting to read other than, and he pulled the string and shot the arrow, right? Still, the blessed gods of mortal did not forget you, Menelaus. So they, they remember Menelaus, they're not gonna let him die. And first among them, this is daughter, that's Athena, the spoiler who standing in front of you fended aside the tearing arrow. So it's just a, um, a slightly confusing wording in the sentence, but saying that, that Athena protects Menelaus. I might actually write that down. Athena protects Menelaus. All right. She brushed it, brushed aside away from his skin as lightly as when a mother brushes a fly from her child who's lying in her sleep. It's so easy for her to do. Steering herself the arrow's course straight to where the golden belt buckles joined and the halves of his corselet were fitted together. The, the, bit, the bitter arrow was driven against the joining of the war belt and passed clean through the war belt elaborately woven. So here's a quick picture I have of, oh, that's moving all around, so hold on, let's try that. Um, here's a quick picture that I have of a Greek warrior. Looks like actually a G.I. Joe, I got it offline. It's fairly accurate. And so if you have the corslet here, right, where the arrow went is it went right about here, where the belt is, okay? So Athena steered the arrow to this area, okay? So he's gonna be basically wounded, okay? And it's not gonna be a serious wound as we're gonna read here in just a second. All right, so where, where the golden belt buckles joined and the halves of his corslet were fitted together. So actually probably, if I'm gonna be a little more precise, there's two sides of the corslet here and it kind of goes right in between in the part where they're, they're kind of stitched together on the side. At least that's the way I'm reading. If any of you guys have any different interpretations, let me know, but that's kind of what I would imagine is what's going on. Into the elaborate wrought course that the shaft was driven and the guard with which he wore to protect his skin and to keep the spears off which guarded him best. Yet the arrow plunged even through this also. So it went through two layers 
with the very tip of it, its point, it grazed the man's skin and straightway from the cut there gushed a cloud of dark blood. So it's a clean wound. It's not a serious wound. And so um, it will heal. Sorry, but this is a little hard to read. It will heal. And Menelaus is safe. All right. So M is safe. I put that. So, um, yeah. So that's basically what's going on. So big picture, what's going, what's happening here is Zeus and Hera get together. Zeus does a little bit of reverse psychology on Hera to get her to think that it's her idea to get the Greeks fighting again. And then um, they basically send Athena down. And Athena convinces poor Pandarus, poor Pandarus, to um, shoot an arrow and lightly wound Menelaus. But the thing is, it's going to look bad because there's a gush of blood coming out of his wound. And that's all they want. They just need a spark. So you could put here, um, this is a spark, right? This is a spark. A spark for what fire? Huh? For war. All right. That's it for book four.